we had a two-story house and I could just see everything just on fire and looting was happening and it was scary being trapped in a house. But I remember and we never crossed my dad. I don't know what I mean. <laughs> he, he ruled with an iron fist and so we knew not to mess around. You stay your butt in the house. Seven kids at that yeah. time in South Los Angeles and not that my dad should get some big sticker, but I mean, that's, that's very hard to go right. like, and all of us on the straight and narrow path. But that was because there was a the presence of the father. And I think dads need the love. So I always try to make sure that I keep the legacy of what my father has done for me with my kids as well. In a world filled with adversities, there are those who refuse to succumb to the role of victim, instead choosing to rise above their circumstances and create their own destiny. Today, I'm thrilled to share my conversation with Akbar Baja Biamila, a man who has defied the odds and shattered stereotypes, even amid the turmoil of South Central Los Angeles during the tumultuous 1990s. With his engaging personality and magnetic charisma, Akbar has become a household name as the host of popular TV shows, like American Ninja Warrior, where he ignites the spirits of contestants to conquer seemingly impossible obstacles. The Talk and his upcoming reality show, Fight to Survive. As a first generation American, Akbar's journey is deeply rooted in his immigrant upbringing. Raised by strong-willed Nigerian parents, he was instilled with the values of hard work, education, and finishing what you start. These principles shaped his character and nurtured an unwavering belief that he could transcend the challenges that surrounded him. Akbar's journey serves as a beacon of hope, reminding us all of the untapped power within ourselves to overcome obstacles and realize our dreams. Akbar Olawa Kemi Iru Baja Bila Mila. Close. I'll give it to you though. <laughs> I give it to you. Baja be a Miller, but that was good. I was good. I liked it. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Dad Saves America. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. You know, coming in, I'm like, I think this is pronounced some, somewhat the way the Italian pronunciations. The eyes is e's, but only the first i is e, and then the second i is more like a i. Yeah, yeah, right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So it's Yoruba, and GB is an actual alphabet. So b, and the Baja be a Miller. So, so yeah. Be a Miller. Yeah. Okay. Now I understand that your dad believes that. You're, it's really important to say your name. Yes, make them say your name. <laughs> uh, I always have to use my dad's accent. Um, you know, my dad growing up reminded me of James Earl Jones' character, um, King Jaffe Jaffer, ruler of Zamunda, because my dad had the same size and that deep voice. And, you know, growing up here in LA, uh, I used to get made fun of a lot. And so, I was embarrassed of our Nigerian last name. And he was like, I was like, man, I wish I could have just a regular name. And so I remember coming home one day, you know, you know, upset about the kids teasing me at school. And my dad was like, make them say your name. And the way he said it was like kind of frightening. And then after all, it just was a pivot in my head where, no, I'm gonna make you say my name. Like, you know, so when teachers would try to get out of it, nope, you can try. I'm not gonna be offended, but you're gonna try because the kids would laugh when they would try. And you just know what? No kid wants to be the butt of the joke. You know what I mean? So, but then I flipped it and I'm like, no, I'm sitting here and I'm going to milk this all day, even if it takes an extra 30 seconds of, of class time, you know? Well, that should make you the kid's favorite because you get a chance to put the teacher in the hot seat. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I would, and I would do that. I was just telling my kids this because they're at the point where they're experiencing, you know, middle school can also be very, very rough. That's a rough period for any kid. And I said, you know what? You can kind of control the classroom when, especially if you got a substitute or they're doing, you know, like they're doing, and you just sit there and like, I know you're trying to say my name, but I'm just gonna wait till you say it all the way through, you know? What is it about that make me say your name that you think he was getting at there? What was below the surface? Oh boy. You know, I think every father gets to this point where you see that your kid is, you know, struggling in their environment. And so I think even for me as a father now, I now look back and go, you know, I think a dad's DNA is to direct and to protect, right? You wanna constantly direct your kids and, you know, and I think in that moment, my dad was A, trying to protect me and direct me on what to do in that moment. And I'll never forget, it was in the fifth, I think it was like fifth or sixth grade, 
where it was a switch about how I felt about myself. And from that point, it started to grow because I was embarrassed. Like, can you imagine just walking around just embarrassed? Like, oh man, like I raised my hand af after Garcia. I knew my name was coming after, I'm GB. I knew I'm coming after Garcia, right? Maria Garcia, <laughs> I still remember her name. Maria Garcia, oh, I'm next, I'm, me, 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 me. That was me early before then because I didn't want my name to be said. So I didn't have to get everybody laughing. So, but that's what my dad instilled. And so from that point, it instilled pride in me. Like I took ownership of who I was because I can't change that. So that's what my dad did for me. And it helped me academically. It helped me athletically um, in being able to, to have confidence. Yeah. So your, your dad is, um, was born in Nigeria. Yeah. So tell me about your parents' experience. Sort of how did that history shape your household? You know, there's this duality that I had growing up. I grew up in a hood uh, in South Los Angeles in the Crenshaw District. But I grew up rough in a neighborhood. rough neighborhood at the time. Uh, grew up, though, in a Nigerian household. So I ate Nigerian food and we lived a Nigerian culture. But then at school, I had to be, quote unquote, black American. Right. And I'm trying to fit in with my peers. And so there was this duality that I had where you can get lost in that. But my parents, their dream was to come to this country and that their kids would have a better opportunity than them. And so. Yeah. For the most part, they did that, you know, raising seven kids in Los Angeles. And, you know, my father knew that he wanted out from where he was so he'd have the ability to grow. Both my mom and dad, entrepreneurs. My dad was a plumber. My mom was a, a beautician. So she did hair and everything else and nails and all that kind yeah. of stuff. And, um, yeah, it was just cool. It was cool seeing my parents, you know, struggle but work hard at the same time, if that makes sense. You know, I remember there was a time, and I'm very careful on how I say this because my perspective has changed since I went back home to Nigeria to see where my family grew, where my dad and mom grew up. I used to say when I grew up, I grew up poor. But then when I went back home and I saw the difference in lifestyle, I said, oh, wow, like I can't say, I can't say that anymore because my parents lived the big dream. They made it. They made it. And so, but um, for, for me, it was looking, looking at that and seeing that my parents, you know, worked hard to get us to this country so we would have the ability to have upward movement in our life. It's funny because my first guest on this show, a guy, a guy by the name of Mike Yates, we, we, he's African-American. Um, and he was telling a story about when he was in college, yeah. he participated in a debate about what it means to be black in America. Okay. And so, and some of it was about some of it was between people whose, you know, parents and grandparents had been here and yeah. even went back to slaves. And people like your family mm -hmm. who were first generation immigrants yep. Yep. who basically see their understanding of race and of being here in this country like in a way kind of very differently. Yeah. And that it was it was it was a real debate. It was like a serious when you talk about sort of the duality of that, I've heard that. From I was a lot stuck of in folks. the middle. I was stuck in the middle because I remember, you know, being young and telling my friends, you know, um, or classmates, you know, you're African. No, I'm not. You know, I got Indian in my blood is what they would say back then. Um, I know that that's politically incorrect now, but I mean, that's what they would say back then. Or they were like, my mama from or my daddy from Louisiana or I'm Creole. It was anything to be anything but African. And that was weird to me because I was like, we're black. Black folks come from Africa. Like, what else would you be? But that's because I grew up in a household that taught me differently. So there was this different, like, it was a line drawn, like, you know, from, you know, again, this is from my own people, African booty scratcher, I'd be called, right? And all these other mean names that kids would say, like, don't play with him because he's African, which was like, fool, you're African too. Cause I grew up in an all black, you know, right. neighborhood. So it was weird. And so that's when that, you know, for me trying to fit in, cause even though I was sure of who I was, I was also unsure at the same time because I wasn't accepted. And so it was like doing this dance, which was weird, but it was a line in that I think black Americans, because of, you know, slavery and yeah. because of the loss of identity and loss of name and all of that, it really then generationally created this, this disdain towards, you know, first generation, you know, African, like myself, you know, here in America. Well, and then the broader conversation about yeah. race doesn't even, 
distinguish that. Yeah. So like we have this bigger picture about what's going on that doesn't draw any of these finer points in it. Yeah. But you you weren't just experiencing this. You were in South Central Los Angeles yeah. in the nineties. Yeah. So tell me about that experience because you're talking about the Rodney King yeah. riots yeah. happening Which, in your in, neighborhood. Literally in my neighborhood. I remember. I mean, oh boy, I feel this is gonna be crazy at the time, and you have to forgive me because I was young at the time. I realized and understood the magnitude of it the first time that this was being videoed. Um, before everyone walked around with cell phone cameras, you know, you would, I would experience that, and my brothers and my neighbors and my friends would experience police harassment, but no one would believe us. So it was almost like this, see, we're telling you it happened. It's for real, it really does. And the world saw that. But I remember as a kid thinking like, oh man, we get to miss a week of school, you know, cause everything was on fire and everything was burning and stuff. But you know, you look now, obviously that was a massive, massive, I mean, it was a blow to not only black Americans, but to America as a, as a whole, because it showed the ugly side that we now see unfortunately m more frequently than than we should you know what i mean like yeah because it shouldn't be happening at all so what kind of what were the paramount values in your family because I, <laughs> I you know i know from read your book <laughs> go to school <laughs> yeah what were the <laughs> you got you got james earl jones in your house yep. what are your mom and dad saying you know drilling into you you talk to any nigerian and they would tell you the first things first is academics and it was important that you got your study in. I mean, we would sneak to watch TV and, you know, during the week and we'd run upstairs, my dad feeling the temperature of the TV to see if it was on, <laughs> you know, put it, you know. He's uh, not joking around. Oh, wasn't joking around. And we all, you know, hey, as soon as he comes home, I'm like, <laughs> I think back to it now, my dad had to have known. We all just ran upstairs and opened the book and like this, like, mm -hmm, we're reading, <laughs> but, that was that, and then I think it was the hard work that my parents modeled. I mean, my dad literally had a, a beeper pager on him and his one man, he was a one man wrecking crew as a plumber around Los Angeles. I drive around now and I complain, but I couldn't imagine my dad having to go from Burbank to South Los Angeles to Beverly Hills to Inglewood, back over to Sherman Oaks and just drive. Oh yeah. I mean, it's impossible. 24 hour, he had a 24 hour line where you call me anytime and I'll pop up. So my dad could come home for the night, 10 o'clock, boom, 2 a.m., an emergency call. So it was like my dad was kind of like an on-call doctor, but a plumber, you know what I mean? And he did that for years, years. My mom, hairstylist. Um, but they modeled that for us, what it means to have work. So I know nothing else but hard work. Um, when did your dad first teach you how to take apart a trap and clean it out? A trap? What is that? You know, under the sink. The uh... oh, oh, you know yeah. what? Um, so it, this is interesting, and this did you did he did he spare you I, that? Did he I not? Hate, I actually hate it. So my other brother, uh, there was five boys, uh, six boys, one girl. I'm number six of seven. Um, my brother before me, Kabir, he loved going uh, to work with my dad. I actually hated it, but I was actually grateful for the experience, my dad, because it made me realize. I don't want to do this for a living. Like I was very sure I didn't want to do this, one, but it gave me an appreciation for what my dad did. So, I mean, I probably wasn't the best helper when it came to, <laughs> you know, I would just run to the truck and my dad naming off some weird tools. Till this day, I am the son of a plumber, but I don't even you're know. you're a disaster. I'm a disaster. <laughs> I mean, I know how to work a screwdriver, a hammer, you know, like the pliers, the real simple basic stuff. Outside of that, I don't know the name of any of those things, but he's like, go get me this, go get that. My favorite though was the snake, you know, to like, oh, like yeah. clean out a main line. Cause that was just like, you know, and then you just like, I was very interested to see what the heck came out. And uh, obviously it was <laughs> the always The disgusting hair. mysteries. It was hair, it was yeah. always hair. It was always hair and some other things um, that was like, how did that, what? So um, uh, that was my favorite part. But outside of that, the smell, I didn't like the dirtiness crawling up underneath the crawl space. And, but my son had this same experience, not as a plumber, but when he got his first job at Chick-fil-A and my wife was like, no, but he's going to smell like grease and he's going to smell like this. And I was like, babe, he needs to experience this in life because it will set his mind to what he wants to do. And when he came yeah. home, he's like, I don't want to do this. I don't like the way it smells. Da, da, da. It's slippery, the grease on the floor. Oh, yeah. And I was like, you need to have that soon because then 
you know exactly. And once I had that experience with my father and it set me on a path of what I wanted to do, so I didn't have to be forced into that, my son had that same experience. He's experiencing that right now, so, which is great. So, um, Baja Bia Miller yep. means something. Big man, come save me. <laughs> Did they know? It's a, that's, like a, that's like a prophetic name. It was a nickname. <laughs> it was a nickname. The last name started out as a nickname uh, because, uh, you know, from the story my father tells me, our great-great-grandfather uh, was a seven-footer. He was a very big man. And in their village, whenever someone would have an issue, he would come out and mediate that. So when they would call for him, they would call for him as that nickname, and that nickname stuck as a family last name. So it's only anybody with the last name Bajabia Miller is a family member. So it's not like, oh, you could have a Smith over here and a Smith over there. This is a unique family name that is for one lineage. Like, so. When does that start? Do you know when that starts? No, I should get that. My brother um, actually did a family tree and really went out and like, like wanted to know, but I don't have all the information as far as one, but he has it um, as far as the, the date of when that started. That's really, I didn't realize that. Yeah. So that's, that's amazing. So that yeah. was like your, your, your family name was given. It was given. <laughs> it was given. Yeah. And that's how culturally it happens. Like my father named right, my like kids. Smith in a way. Yeah. yeah like, you know. but, but you know, in Nigeria, your, your, your name means something. You're not just given a random name. It, yeah. It's, so my father, you know, I gave my father the honor of naming my kids and giving their name. They gave them the, the Arabic name and their, and their Nigerian name. And so that's the tradition, just like my name was given by his family. So, so yeah, so it's, it, it tells a story. So you have this, you have this powerful family yeah. that has really strong values and has chosen to come to America. And yet you're at the center of what is essentially the George Floyd moment of the of the nineties, yeah. the first and the first time really where it's broadcast because yeah. now we have cable news. And everything. There's, this yeah. is happening. This is a national conversation. What were your parents telling you about how to think about America? Because I bet you were getting a pretty unique message compared to even like your friends and neighbors who didn't have immigrant yeah. parents. Yeah, it was uh, it was interesting because my parents fled Nigeria after the Biafra War. But I didn't, they didn't talk to us a lot about that at that time. Um, but I could only imagine what they must have been feeling because my parents still went out to go work. And it was scary being trapped in a house. But I remember, and we never crossed my dad. I don't know what I mean. <laughs> he, he ruled with an, iron, with an iron fist and stick. So we knew not to mess around. You stay your butt in the house. And so for, we had a two-story house and I could just see everything just on fire and looting was happening and you know i just remember coming back to school after the week or whatever it was two weeks one week i can't remember everybody coming back with new clothes and new stuff my mom only brought a dirty ashy can and we didn't even really drink soda like that of seven up and like here this is what i found on the street this is what you guys get it was a six pack i'll never forget seven up green one and that was it but what they taught me it was less about what they talked to us about what they taught us it's to keep you know keep centered to who you are your moral beliefs like stealing was not right you know the looting and stuff like mm -hmm. that yeah. um that was that was happening but also too like my parents were very afraid about the reality of america that you know somebody could just be beat to like my mom was the nurturer she was like oh my god like, oh, don't yeah. be careful don't do this you know like you know, it used to be, you know, at the time, you know, don't wear any red in my neighborhood. Now it was like, you got to also be mindful of the cops. So that we had that conversation, you know, what not to wear and also to be careful about the cops. So they all, they kind of became, you know, not enemy number one, but they were on that list. And so you can't trust, you can't trust experience. them. So, yeah. You can't trust. So it was kind of like, Oh, like, you know, five Oh, five Oh, that was, you know, that's what we would say, you know, growing up and, you know, which is weird though. You know, you think about that. I mean, I'm, I'm going back and I'm thinking now as an adult, but also thinking about what my reality was then, because it's all that I knew, but you know, my parents did, I thought did a good job of trying to block a lot of the noise for us because they didn't want to get distracted with it. And so I appreciate that. So a lot of the stuff, the, the social political stuff 
I wasn't as in tuned when I was a kid. And I think it was on purpose. Like I remember on a different subject, like I remember my dad having a conversation. Technically we could have probably qualified for, for welfare, but my dad was like, it, it was a foreign concept to me. What, what do you mean? I can go out there and work myself. Like what, 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 do, what, what do you mean? You know, like it just wasn't a thing that he thought. <laughs> and so he wanted to instill those values into us. And so we didn't get into should it, should it not, and like go out there and work. There's a yeah. ride going, stay your butt in the house, all right, until this thing clears out. You know, don't worry about all this other stuff. And so that was pretty much it. But it wasn't like a sit down talk because they were at that time tw less than 20 years in the country. You know what I mean? Less right. than 20 years in the country at that time. Yeah. You know, we were talking to your buddy Jaleel. Yeah. And he, he said something similar, which was that his, he, he didn't realize he was, he, he was in, you know, relative poverty mm. again, by American standards right. until he got to be like 13, 14 years old. And that he cherished that his parents shielded him from that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that, how do you think about the role of being a dad and being a parent in, in protecting your kids from things that might be important for them to ultimately understand, but not as kids? like that being that filter for some of the harsher parts of the world. It's harder now. Uh, it, it is harder now as a, as a father, you know, of four kids, it's hard to shield your kids from a lot of stuff because it's coming in faster than, in fact, I, sometimes I, I have this feeling that I'm not doing a good enough job with my kids because whereas I've tried to block them from social media and from having like, they don't have social anything. I have them on my stuff. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, I have them on my stuff, and that was done, you know, on purpose. So, like, look, I want them to kind of participate, but not be on it all the time. But yeah. then comes the pandemic, and then they're passing out laptops and iPads, and now my kids yeah. find ways to go on YouTube and look at YouTube shorts, and it's just like it's information overload because they need it for homework. I want to take it away, but they need it to do home. You know what I mean? And they're going and it's just like whoa and I had this moment this crazy moment I don't even know if this answers your question but I had this crazy moment my son falls asleep on his bed and he has his iPad next to him his school assigned iPad yeah and it's YouTube shorts and it's these videos and I just sat there and I'm like this boy done fell asleep and I'm just listening to it I'm like it seems innocuous but it's also rewiring their brains about all of these these life commandments about race, about, and they're, they're all done in jokey ways, but they're done in a jokey way to penetrate their psyche, to start to retrain them. And I'm like, man, they're getting thousands and thousands of yeah. points that they're just getting in quick, quick bites that you can't control. And so, you know, some will say, well, you're hovering over them too much. I'm like, my parents had control because like, there's only so much information you were getting now it's like before i can even have the conversation of sex boom social media is getting oh, to yeah. it before you can have this you know about race in america boom it's getting to them i don't even have the opportunity to present to them like the way i want to raise my kids it's they're getting it at school there's all these other propagandas that are happening and it's just like you're sitting back and you're going like man am i letting my kids down you know what i mean do i have to you know, let off the gas as far as going to work and doing this and just say, hey guys, let's hunker down and it's just gonna be us homeschooling and I won't ever leave and I won't, you know, I can't provide at, you know, whatever level I want to. I just have to be here because it's, it's happening fast and no parent in America can fight against social media, the internet and how much information is coming in. It's coming in at a pace that I don't think it's, in my opinion, is for kids their brains are still forming. They're in the directive stage. Now, once they get into the decision-making stage, they should be able to, but I need time in the directive stage. What I love about the Jewish culture is that you have, you know, the bar mitzvah, right? And the bat mitzvah. Yeah. And it's that time where they go from the directive to decision-making around 13 years old. Well, before my kids are 13 years old, my twins, they're getting all this stuff that I can't even, I'm like, gosh, I don't even have time to teach them. You know what I mean? It's one of those things, it's funny that you bring up bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs, because it's something that as a father of a now 18 year old, I've thought about, we had these things, these traditional like rites of passages mm -hmm. and they would happen around that age, right? That like I'm Catholic. And so that that's like confirmation re religiously, but it feels like we've kind of lost 
that in modern modern times right. like that moment where it's like now you're a man son right. like it, i didn't know when to do that like right. it wasn't clear like there wasn't like a thing that's this is the thing we're going to do that we do as a culture right because we're we're building we're building the roof before we're building the foundation right and i think that's why you asked earlier like you know talking about the anxiety and a lot of the stuff that's going on with you know, with the young kids, I think a lot of that is because the roof is being built first. You know, you think about it, you have time, 13 years to groom your kids and build a foundation of what's important, the values, the things that, you know, were instilled in you from your parents and from your religious belief. You have the opportunity 13 years, like every parent should have that time, right? It's life is difficult enough. Like, right. I need that time, the three or four hours I get in the evening to be able to spend that time with my kids. But now it's just like, I am I feel like I'm a, more of a defender, right? I'm going back to my football days, playing defensive <laughs> end and trying to defend, right? Like I'm going in, I'm trying to defend everything that they're getting and I can't, right? So that's that's the challenge. You had some mentors. Yeah. Before, and you've, I, like we all have a lot of mentors, but I know there's a woman named um, Melinda McMullen yeah. <clears throat> that came into your life early. Tell me about her. Well, Melinda, you know, a very fascinating woman. She, you know, she was a, a power executive at the time. I think she was working for IBM. And after the Rodney King riots, you know, she felt like, you know, she wanted to contribute in a different way. And she wanted to go in because my neighborhood got wrecked. Liquor stores and grocery stores yeah. and all sorts of things were burned down. It was like walking around in whatever war-torn country you can think of. And that was like that for decades afterwards, you know what I mean? Like where some of these buildings were burned down and that was, you know, that was that. But in the rebuilding phase, Melinda came along, along with the teacher, Tammy Bird at Crenshaw High School to start a company called Food from the Hood. And it started off as just with a garden in the background and in the back of the high school to be able to give vegetables and fruits and stuff like that to the locals after we had lost everything, you know, a lot of these stores, yeah, local grocery, yeah, stores, grocery stores. And then she brought the business element and said, Hey, we could start a company, a salad dressing company. That salad dressing company turned into food from the hood. It was a salad dressing that was sold nationwide and it was very profitable. Uh, it turned into the first student owned salad dressing company right out of South, South Los Angeles. But what she taught us then, like it was the first time I learned how to use the internet, AOL, I didn't have that at home. You know, the dial up, the computer, all of this stuff, she gave us a business sense on how to run a business and teaching us as we were like giving us assignments and we had our business card and we had to go sell at expos, at expos and we would do all these things. We were, we were running the business. We were all part owners. So ex explain how did you per like, how did you get connected? Did she come to this and you were going to that school? Yeah, I was going to Crenshaw okay. high school yeah. and my brother Kabir, he was already at Crenshaw high school. So he was a part of the first way I was still in middle school when that was happening. And then when I got to high school, I saw what he was doing and I was like, Oh man, I want to be a part of this business because all of the money that you accumulated turned into a scholarship afterwards. So just like anybody else who goes out for work, your nine to five job, whatever you put in, you got paid for that, but you didn't get paid in, in that year. It was what you would get your senior year. And I think my senior year, because I was a two sport athlete, I think I walked away with 56. And since I had a full scholarship, athletic scholarship, I walked away with like $5,600 in wow. 1997. And I was like, whoa, like, you know, went from zero to $5,600. And so I used that to buy like my first laptop at school. I had a ThinkPad, an IBM ThinkPad. And then I used the rest of the money for all college stuff. But it was like, man, that was powerful. And all the different things that I learned, you know, in that helped me to be confident in being able to know exactly what I wanted to do when I got to, uh, she was VP of uh, communications. I wanted to get into communication because she had such an influence on me at the time. And uh, we still have a relationship today. And yeah, so I said, I wanted to be a communication major. Yeah. You know, in some ways it's like, we, these people come into our lives, they're like angels because mm -hmm. it's a weird thing. It's like, this shapes your life and it's in the aftermath of, of tragedy, basically. Right, because what it did was it reshifted. Like, it's very easy coming out of the riot to be very angry, right? Yeah. And rightfully so. I mean, there was a lot to be angry about. But what it did was it took a lot of that energy and redirected it into 
problem solving, how to build, how to rebuild a community and how to build something out of nothing. Like we started a salad dressing company and it wasn't in a local store. You could find it from here to Florida, to Virginia, to New York. It was crazy. Like it was, heck, now King Charles, I can name drop. Like I know a lot of people name drop celebrities in Los <laughs> Angeles. I can say I actually had lunch with King Charles. He was then Prince Charles. When he came to Crenshaw High School and had lunch in our garden at Food from the Hood and tasted some of our salad dressing. That's how big time it was. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine being in high school and you know you get a royal coming up to to come hang out and taste the product that you made? Like that that's, was that was nuts. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. So speaking of sort of paths, tell me about your grappling with sports early on. So I understand that football wasn't the thing you really wanted to do. No, I, I didn't. <laughs> I, I didn't want to play football. I thought football was barbaric. It's for barbarians. Um, <laughs> I grew up in L.A. I, like, there was a sex appeal and a, a sexiness of the Showtime Lakers. And I wanted to play for the Los Angeles Lakers. You couldn't tell me anything different. I was going to play for the Lakers next to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who's my dad's favorite player, Magic Johnson, Michael Cooper, Brian Scott. Like, I was going to be in there. I was going to have, in fact, I even envisioned that my name would have the little curve, like uh, Abdul-Jabbar. You remember how his name had to, it went around 33 like this? Oh, yeah. Uh, Baja Bia Miller was going to go like that, too. You know, that's what it was going to look like on my, on my jersey. I trained hard. Every day, I would be dribbling a basketball and playing for Crenshaw High School at that time was like playing for the Junior Lakers. It was the oh, best bet. basketball program in the country. More championships than anybody from West Coast to the East Coast. We were, that was it. And so my whole goal as a kid was I had to make Crenshaw High School a Crenshaw basketball team. And so I'd make the basketball team. Meanwhile, my brother, you know, was a stud in football since he was a kid. I mean, he was just <laughs> always a stud. And as we get to intersect to high school, he's a senior, I'm a 10th grader. His football coach is like harassing me right. to he's play like, football. I'm like, no, like, like I'm gonna play. And I had the, 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 dumb, the dumb basketball walk, like I'm so cool. It's that lazy, cool walk, like I'm just so cool. And uh, one day I'm strutting across the track while they're in practice, and I see my brother, I just kind of glancing, and he's practicing. But the barbarians playing. The football. barbarians, right? Because, <laughs> you know, uh, they're the barbarians. So I'm walking in, and he calls me over, and I'm like, oh, shoot, they want to holler at me because we're on a basketball squad. What's up, coach? Like, I was cocky, you know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, he comes over, and out of nowhere, gives me, I mean, a gut check. Boom. <laughs> We're sitting there in front of all these guys, like, they're trying to hold it together. And he's drilling me, asking me all these questions. How come you don't want to play football? Like, Coach, I don't want to play, man. Like, this is, this is not me. So long story short. This is back in the good old days when, when the teachers could punch the kids and it yeah, was fine. Yeah, yeah, it was fine. <laughs> there was nothing wrong. I didn't see anything wrong with it, you know? Like, and so, you know, he's, he's harassing me. Then he gets the assistant coach, Coach Abbott, to like, well, why don't you just give it a try? You're an athlete. You're an athlete. I said, fine. I go out there and I give it a try and they're just hacking and fouling me all over the place. I'm crying underneath. My first day of practice, I have my pads on backwards. I'm practicing in basketball shoes. At the time, they didn't have cleats. And what grade size. is this? This is uh, the 11th grade. This oh my is, gosh, you're almost done. Yeah, it, yeah <laughs> it's, it's, it's the 11th grade. And I was like, I can't do this. I quit. And Coach Garrett calls my dad knowing that- like, that's, that's not a word he, it, he accepts. Is yeah, it? right. My dad said, you did what? You start it, you finish it. And if you don't play football, you don't play basketball. Oh my gosh, that was the worst thing. You know, like my life was over at that point. I was like, no, what, what do you mean? So I had the worst attitude. I didn't want to be there, the whole nine. And I just remember there was a moment where I was like, you know what, forget it. I, I'm in it now, I might as well. Um, so it wasn't until my senior year, because I didn't play my junior year. It wasn't until my senior year where I just said, I'm going to fully commit to it because I got to, because my dad told me I got to play. And I would go on to have five football scholarships and zero basketball. I was an average at best at basketball, but you couldn't tell me that at the time. I was very close to playing for the Lakers. Coach Garrett ended up saving me because I wouldn't have known, like I would have never thought I would have ended up in the NFL. 
but he saw something in me that I couldn't see in myself. And what I love about Coach Garrett, I just visited him just yesterday, uh, two days ago. I visited him and just went by to go see how he was doing, um, still there at the high school. And he changed my life because he saw and invested. He cared so much about his athletes, about his players. He saw something knowing like, I'm telling you, boy, you'd be a lot greater in football than you would be. In, and, man, and, and what it told me was, you know, you got to listen to your mentors. You got to listen to those people who've walked a life way before you were even born and can see things. And so it created a bond that we still carry to today. Before we move on to yeah. that football experience yeah. coming out of high school, you know, you talked about your dad and this powerful message he had mm. for you. Your mom was a colorful character, too. Though. Yeah. What were some of the things about your mom that just yeah. st stick out? as being like, yeah, you know, extraordinary. My, you know, my mom was, um, she was a firecracker. My mom was a firecracker. You know, her and my dad were constantly always at it. But I think what she showed me was commitment to relationships, especially now when you look at divorce rates so high. I didn't realize that, you know, a lot of my friends didn't grow up with two parents in a household. I thought everyone had mom and dad at home. I didn't realize how bad it was and yeah. how great we had it. But in the Nigerian culture, you know, divorce is not really a thing. You know, not saying Nigerians don't get divorced, but it's not a thing. You stay committed to the person you say you're going to stay committed to. But it taught me how to stick with it, right? And so that was kind of the theme. But my mom was a very much a nurturer. She would come there to protect. My relationship was strong with my mom. But, you know, my mom had her demons that she had to fight. Um, one of it was alcoholism. I don't even really talk about this, but that was one of those battles that was very hard to watch her, you know, her go through, which... Yeah, that's it, really difficult. Yeah, it is very difficult, you know, growing up in that in that situation. And, and as a child, you know, the to have that burden to be responsible for a parent. And when you're saying, you know, please don't drink, or, you know, if you're in a car in that situation and you you know, you're experiencing this as a kid and you're seeing all of this stuff and it changes the way you think about a lot of things. Um, it's very yeah. hard as a kid to see weakness in your parents like that. It is. And, uh -huh. and choice, when you see a choice that your parents are making that you know, you already kind of are old, can understand that it's a bad choice. That's right. a really weird place to be. It is because, you know, it leaves you, it, it leaves you feeling not hopeless, but well, who are you going to turn to if not your parents? Right. <laughs> like, and he's just like, so here you are trying to think, I'm thinking in my mind that I could do certain things. And as kids, you know, you're, you're selfish. Kids are very selfish, <laughs> the most selfish yeah. people on the, on the planet. But I, I think that's why we tell people to grow up yeah, when they're acting. <laughs> right. <laughs> Cause I think, but God designs it that way for, to sharpen adults. And, but you see everything through your lens. So for me, I took this certain responsibility, like, it's my fault that I can't get her to stop drinking, right? Oh, yeah. And so you're trying to figure out different things. How can you make them happy? And I think this is where some of my personality of trying to be a people pleaser, like what can I do to make her happy to where she doesn't have to drink, you know? And so it was that dance until my mother passed. But it was my father that I really just watch as a, you know, and it's one of the things that, you know, made me want to come here because... You know, fathers don't get appreciated enough. I mean, if I didn't have my father in my life, I don't know where I would be. But today, if it's in media, if it, you know, music, you know, fathers are dumb. Fathers don't know what's going yeah. on in their kids' lives. Fathers are all these things. This is what they're portraying. Like, or you Homer know, Simpson. Yeah, yeah, or, best. yeah right. Or, or, or Al Bundy. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, even the term toxic masculinity is stripping and emasculating men from being you know, who they, when I said that men are innately born to direct and correct, right? But we're not really, we're not really being able in this society, it's very hard to, to really own up to that and going, yeah, because you have to, or at least, you know, I know that talking to a lot of my friends who are fathers, you know, the pressure to work within the space that is acceptable to women, right into this where, oh, you have to father like this. You have to father like, like, like being able to give men the opportunity to really lead their family, to lead their kids. We live in a society that does not appreciate fathers and are removing fathers from the home. 
even in divorce, you see how fathers are separated yeah. from their kids. And it's easy for fathers to be moved off to the side and not be a part. And, you know, you hear some some of these life commands like, well, he's got to fight to be in in his kid's life. Well, why does he have to fight to be in his kid's life if he wants to be in his kid's life? And that to me is just one of those things. So I always, you know, I, I try to make sure that I keep the legacy of what my father has done for me with my kids as well and letting them know the importance of that presence because, you know, it could have been like seven kids at that yeah. time in South Los Angeles. And not that my dad should get some big sticker, but I mean, that's, that's very hard to go right. like, and all of us on the straight and narrow path, all of us on the straight and narrow path. You know what I mean? No I mean, rest, no drugs, no alcohol, no like none of that. Like, but that was because there was a presence of the father. But you know, many may go, well, you know, that was supposed to happen. Like, no, no, no. Like, my father needs. <laughs> if my dad won't say it, but I'll say it. My father needs a lot of credit for that because he did a magnificent job. And there are so many other fathers who are doing a magnificent job. You don't hear after games people say, you know, hey, thank you, dad. Right? They don't give dads love, and I think dads need the love. And I love that you're doing this because dads need to be seen in a different light than the way they're viewed today. Oh my gosh. Well, first yeah. of all, I, I'm going to clip that out and just yeah. put our logo. Cause it's like, here's what we're about yeah. is what you just said. Everything that you just said to me is like a, you've given voice to so much of what we exist on this show to do and what our whole team is working for every day, because there's a baby out with the bathwater thing going on. Mm -hmm. when it comes to being a man in American society in particular. And it's this tension about strength, I think. No, no. Oh. That there's, some, there's a thing about strength that has parts that people wish you could take away and still keep the good part. Yeah, but, but you know, it all comes with it. It's a part of the experience. There's gonna be good and bad in a lot of experience. There was this viral clip that just went viral on social and I absolutely loved it. There was this daughter who, it, her and her father are fishing and she's willing in, and I don't know how to fish, but she's willing in, I might be saying it wrong, but she's willing it in and she's like, daddy, I can't. Like, daddy, I can't. And she's helping, but like, nope, I'm not gonna help you. Daddy, but I got something, isn't it? Like, no, I'm not gonna, you're gonna do it yourself. Like, no, but daddy, please, daddy. I'm like, no, you got it. And he's telling her, he's like, be strong. He's like, and she wills that thing in and she's like this. And she does it herself, I'm like, Daddy, I caught it, I caught it. And I just like, ah, I'm literally, ah, I'm just crying <laughs> because the cheer that she had, but I could see so many going, that's toxic masculinity. No, that's the way the father knows how to best be able to raise his daughter. And why shouldn't that be embraced? Nobody could ever turn around and demonize a mother for nurturing. Why should we demonize a man for leaning into who he is? You know, we live in a society where everybody say, hey, be you, do you, and all this other kind of stuff. But when a man does what he wants, the way he knows how to do, somehow it's looked at as bad. But it was such a precious moment. And I could see some of the naysayers in the comments saying, well, he could have at least helped her out. Like, no, that's fine. Because she was like, dad, I don't even care how big the fish is or how much it weighs. Because there's like, that's a big one. She's like, I don't even care how much it weighs, dad. I caught it. I did it. I did it. I can only imagine how long she was casting before she actually caught something. And to be able to figure like she did it herself. That confidence will last with that girl for the rest of of her life, she will never forget it. That's that thing that, like your dad's message, mm. don't quit. Yep. Oh, you started this thing, you're gonna finish it. It's it's so important and it so cuts against this you be you. Right. Like, what do you mean me be me? Yeah. Like, the me of today is, I don't wanna be the me of today forever. Right. Well, how am I gonna get to the me of tomorrow if I don't recognize that I'm not perfect? <laughs> like, I have all these things. I mean, you're saying, I didn't wanna play football. Right. I'm gonna be a basketball star because I'm at the best place for that to happen right. in the entire country. And your dad's like, no, you're staying on football. Right. Or you're not gonna play basketball. Right. You're gonna play nothing. Right. When your kids face that moment, mm -hmm. is it easy for you to draw on that value? Or do you find yourself, because I'll, I'll admit it's hard to wow. not step in today and try to help. I'm a, I'm a tweener because there are a lot of, there's a lot of noise out there, right? I think a lot of people would look now playing Monday morning quarterback and look back and say, hey, the way your father did, he should have done X, Y, and Z, 
right? But my dad did the best that he knew how to. Now I'm more sensitive to all of the extra, you know, like, oh, you should be doing this and you should be doing that. And it, it's like paralysis by analysis. And so I find myself sometimes like, uh, okay, am I playing more to, you know, maybe uh, an emotional type of response versus, okay, here, I'm clear cut. Because the way I was designed, the way God designed me, I can be very focused and clear cut. I'm like, I think this is the best way to approach this. I'm not saying that it's the perfect way to do it, but the only way you really know your superpower is you A, learn from your mistakes, yeah. right? And you go, oh, you know what? That didn't work. I learned that with my 22 year old. Look, the way I parent my oldest son is totally different than the way I parent my 14 year old and my twins. Because there are things that I did that I'm going, hmm, that didn't work, right? Not because I'm a bad father, but you know, you, you're learning, right? You're just, you're learning on the go. But the worst thing I think that can happen is like paralysis by analysis, where you start to deny yourself, at least for me, I felt the pressure and the guilt to do whether, you know, my wife and I might disagree on something or the social pressure to be, you know, m more emotional or more whatever, you know what I mean? Like there's a social pressure that tells you that being the way you're being a father is not right. And yeah. I fight against that sometimes. Like, no, like, there's nothing wrong with how I'm, I'm fathering. You know what I mean? Like, there's nothing wrong. You talked about God's design. Yeah. Tell me about, because one of the things that I, I know is th the case is that your mother and father had different religious traditions. Yeah, they did. So that's really something. To, to be together, and what you've described as a home that's a difficult marital environment in, in so far as you've got seven kids in the yeah. house. Yeah. You're in... Uh, is it technically South Central or something? When I grew up, it was South Central. Now they're saying it's South LA. I don't okay. know what it is. South Central, South in, LA. Yes. Yeah. You're in. You, we're talking about the same, the Crenshaw District. Yeah, you're yeah. in the Crenshaw District. Tough neighborhood, tough times. Your mom is struggling with alcohol. Mm -hmm. And then they don't they don't share religion. No. So t they, and they, they worked it out. And they, so tell me about the faith situation, the faith tradition your understanding of God from your parents and, and, and what's that done for you? So I looked at it as a younger kid. I identified as Muslim because my father, you know, there was just the major respect that we had for my father. And, you know, growing up, I, I didn't see my dad whistling at women and, you know, yo, check, uh, like my dad was very much like by the book, you know, a man driven by principles and his faith. And so, um, there's something that I really just, I, I gleaned on from that. And I was like, all right. It's like a Muslim it, stoicism. Yeah, <laughs> it was just, it was just like, you know what? I wanna, this is what we're doing, right? And so we grew up doing Ramadan and, but it was interesting because the love, you know, for all the things that were tough with my mom and dad, there was a love in being able to work through religious differences. I don't know how they did it, to be quite honest with you. Cause your like, mother was Christian. My mother was Christian, but we would go to the mosque, then go to the church. I'd be in Arabic school on Saturday. I'd be in Sunday school on on Sunday. You know what I mean? Writing left to right, then writing right to left. You know what I mean? Like, wait, what? I mean, it wow. was it was like, whoa. So for me, it was just like, I remember too, I can still remember upstairs and I can see my dad and my mom bringing out the Quran and bringing out the Bible and going back and forth and talking about like their, you know, their commonalities and their differences. And sometimes they would be speaking in Yoruba. Sometimes they would be speaking in English. They would go in and out, broken English. And you're just sitting there trying to understand it all. But, you know, as a kid, you're just like, hey, I'm going to follow, I'm going to follow the leader. And so, but it wasn't until I got to college where I made a difference. So I appreciated my mom and father being able to raise us, you know, and some will say, hey, they weren't equally yoked, uh, fair, but they were able to show, you know, respect for each other. And for me, you know, when I joined the talk uh, a couple of years ago, one of the themes that has driven me because I get so frustrated with a lot of the national conversation being you know, so confrontational. I'm saying yeah. we can have conversation without confrontation. So I say conversation over confrontation is my theme. Um, and I want to be able to discuss our differences without it being confrontational because that's what my mother and father did. They modeled that, that you can have conversation over confrontation. But now it's I mean, just like- a powerful lesson to yeah. play out in real life. In real life, in real life where, you know, and again, this is, you know, we've seen 
where Islam and Christianity have had some very intense relationship in other countries and even here, right? Mm -hmm. And so to especially see- Especially after 9-11. Especially after 9-11. Yeah. So to see that happen and to my mother, for my mother to even go to the mosque and my dad to sit in church with us for, you know, whether it was Easter or, you know, New Year's Eve or whenever we were at church, it felt like all the time, you know what I mean? <laughs> but they had this agreement. It was, uh, maybe it was like, you know, bedroom talk or maybe it was just like this thing, but there was never, you can't go to church or you can't do this. Now, sometimes they would throw a little, you know, I think about they would throw a little shade here and there. My, my dad <laughs> would throw a little shade and like, oh, you know, all they want at the churches, all they want is the, the money. They just always ask for money, you know? I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's why, that's why I always ask you, who's going to give this much for tithing? Who's going to give this? You know, but I mean, you know, <laughs> then my mom would, you know, throw a little shade at my dad. But, you know, it was nothing to where you would go, oh, like, you know, like they would try to pull the rug from the other person, you know? And that made me more empathetic towards people who have, a different belief than me. And it's why I get so frustrated now when, especially in our culture today yeah. in America, if I don't agree with your lifestyle, I'm demonized or labeled, right? You are this and you are that and you are this. And, and the like, most extreme labels possible. How can I pick the most right. extreme thing yeah, to I'm gonna give the motion because it's a way to control you, right? I need to control you, right? This is why, whereas I get what like again, toxic masculinity. I get the idea of it, but it's such an extreme label that you can just throw on anyone, right? Or you can say, you know, he's a, whatever these labels are, right? And I was just like, man, these labels are breaking down communication. They're breaking down the ability to be able to really connect. Cause I believe that God has created us to have community. It's why social media is so big because it models God's ultimate plan for us to be able to have community, for you and I to be able to sit down and have real conversation and be able to have a greater purpose than to tear each other down. My experience with that was like, I was raised in a very like politically conservative, all Catholic, 100% mm -hmm. Italian Catholic, very politically conservative um, family. And I'm still pretty conservative. And my uncle Bill, who passed away a year ago, he was a trial lawyer, he was a, a liberal Democrat, and he's one of the men that's a pillar of my life. We would have these incredible debates every, at every holiday, and I always look forward to it every time. Every, yeah. that, was, that was how we would communicate when we weren't like playing golf together or doing something fun. Yeah. He was incredibly loving. And so he taught me that these two things can live together. You can, be, you can disagree about things and love each other. Yeah. And man, do we need that yeah. right now. I hope that the next generation of kids, my kids, will go, we're just tired of all this, this, that, the other, the labeling, the demonizing, and we're just so fun. Like, we don't wanna fight anymore. We don't wanna fight anymore. Like, there has to be a way where we can agree to disagree, where we can have conversation over confrontation. And that's my prayer, that's my hope, that that's where, you know, and I'm trying to, you know, do my best to raise my kids to be strong in their beliefs, you know, because, the world may tell them that, you know, based on, look, I grew up in a conservative household, you know, um, and and I'm not even talking about from a political standpoint, right. you know, like it was do what's right. What's well, your dad's a principled Muslim. He yeah. stays married to your mother. You're right. He's modeling a very traditional path for you. Yeah, that's exactly. It. And so I'm like, OK, these are core values that somehow sometimes I walk around. I'm not even gonna lie. And this is my flaw as a human. I walk around sometimes, you know, like. Like, should I be an undercover Christian? Because my values may not align with the rest of the world. And so I may be labeled and people may not accept me, even though I'm saying, hey, I can, I can still love you and accept you for who you are, but I can, I don't have to agree that you don't agree with my values. So, but I can't label you, but you can label me. And for my kids to grow up with that and somebody labeling them, like, it's so crazy now that everybody's just labeling everything. And my kids, I'm like, no, 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 time out. And so it's frustrating. It's yeah. frustrating and it's also made, it makes parenting a lot more difficult because that was, um, that was not a part of my childhood at all. There was none of that. I mean, you actually had to be that label to get that label. Now it's just like, if you even just think to someone something, then yeah. they're that. You said something that sounds something like that. I'm gonna extrapolate to That's right. this pattern I see because it's just an easy thing for me to dismiss what you have to say that makes me uncomfortable. Right, right. And you know, I remember my daughter, um, this is a powerful moment that I had as a father. And 
you know, she's at this age, it's still uncomfortable for me that she, you know, I got a crush on such and such. She always does this. I, I don't know why. You, why do you want to scratch your face when you like somebody? Like, oh, he's so hot. And, you know, I figure she's getting at that age where she likes. I mean, shoot, I like, you know, I make. How I think old is she? She's 14 now. Oh, man, you're yeah. in for it. Oh, yeah. So she's got the oh, crush. I mean, no. every and every week it changed. But, you know, I remember coming home one day and she told me, that somebody told her, and I, I forgive me, um, and I'm not trying to be insensitive, I can't remember, but someone told her that she was not heterosexual, she was something else. And I can't remember, there was a, a, a new term that I hadn't heard. And I'm going, wait a second, right? And I'm thinking, okay, you know, how do you handle this? I'm like, how many times have you told me you like X, Y, and Z? It's okay for you to be heterosexual. There's not a bad thing for being heterosexual, right? And so we were having this moment and she says, well, you know, this person at school said that if I join or if I'm a part of this group, that there's power in it. And I'm going, Wait, what power? Yeah, because nobody can mess with you. And I'm telling you, like PTSD took me right back to my childhood because the language then when I was a kid was if you joined a gang, then hmm. you would have power because nobody would mess with you, right? You're protected. And I thought, wow, how does a child, and she was 13 at the time, it's like, how does a child pick that up knowing that being a part of a group could give you a certain type of, and embracing being a victim gives you a certain type of power? And I was just like, I thought, well, that's not fair because that's abuse. That's not how that's supposed to work out, right? Right. And we're having this conversation. And so I just had to, again, do what my dad does, like instill in her, like make them say your name. But it was like, be comfortable in who you are, you know? So there is a, th those are those challenges. So where my dad had to fight against us being a gangbanger. And I remember, <laughs> I remember when my boy Larry joined a gang. I actually write about it in my book. And I didn't want to, but he was my best friend, even though he was a gangbanger. Was this the Crips? Is this what it would have been yeah, the yeah, Crips? Yeah, 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 but they yeah. had posses back then. Yeah. So in middle school, it was posses. And so this was my boy, but I knew that I would get in trouble. But he just kept wearing on me and wearing on me and wearing on me. Uh, I was like, all right, man. All right, man. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll join. Somehow it got to <laughs> my brother and my sister. And my dad found out about it. Boy, I got the biggest whooping. <laughs> I was like, well, there goes that. I can't join, but I mean. You'll need protection from me <laughs> if you do that. I was more afraid of my dad than any blood, Crips. Like, it was like, that was the man I was afraid of. I was like, oh, heck no. But he heard about that. But I'm like, man, what if he didn't hear about it? What would my life have been like? You know what I mean? Because it's very easy. But again, my dad had to discipline me and tell him, like, you're okay. Like, you're going to school with him. You, that's your boy or whatever you guys do in school, but that's where you draw the line. There is no joining a gang and all this other kind of stuff. And so I had to instill, but part of me felt like in this society, like, again, like I'm human, I'm flawed. I'm like, am I doing something wrong for telling my daughter that you're okay being like, I come home all the time and you're always scratching your face talking about you like somebody, you know what I mean? Like, you're okay, you know, because somebody told her she was something that she wasn't, you know what I mean? And I was like, well, no, you're not that. I mean, you're just not. You know, this is such a difficult time for our kids because, yeah. right, especially middle school, high school, their identity, I mean, middle school is like hard, partly because your body's changing. Yeah. So your identity is in this state of crazy flux because right. your body is going through this crazy transformation. I, I remember there was this, um, one of those like internet slideshows mm -hmm. and it was a dad and his kid that he was taking the same picture of him and his kid from birth until it was like age 25 or something. And age 10, 11, 12, 13. It's a little boy, soft, round, little boy, and is a man, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like the transformation in that 12, 13 year old time frame yeah. is crazy. And we're trying to process that. And I think it, it, it's even harder for girls right now when it comes to the social media because mm. they're getting hit with stuff that's just impossible to process. That yeah. We didn't have to deal with that. Right. So what did you do? So how did it, how did it play out with your daughter? It, it played out for her, you know, being comfortable with who she was. Went back, told her friend, like, no, I'm not that. I'm, 
you know, I am who I am. It was like, it's okay, right? Like, it's okay to be black. It's okay to be a girl. It's okay to be heterosexual. It's okay to be tall. You know, um, she's six feet and she's, you know, she's 14 years old. You know what I mean? Oh, like, man. Yeah, so I'm like, it's okay. Like, there's like, you are who you are. And so that's something that I think I'm going to have to continue to carry that on because I think there is the social media aspect and the pressure to be all these other things, to look and envy everyone else's lifestyle, to create comparison. Comparison is the thief of all joy. And that's exactly what social media does. It's constantly comparing. And these kids are sitting there and thinking about, you know, like I just recently implemented this. Hey guys, you have to turn in your, and again, it's so hard. Like, it is hard for me as a parent. Like you have to turn in your iPads. Cause I'm now seeing that they're taking their iPads that was meant for school. Cause I didn't buy them that. Yeah. Like what was meant for school is now being used for them to get yeah, the social media, the social media stuff. and whatever. So they don't have an account because they can't download anything, but they can go on to YouTube and just watch all of the different, and it's just throwing them random stuff. I'm going, my goodness. And I'm seeing personalities starting to change. I'm going, what is it? Like they're losing who they are. And it's like, and anybody who shames parents for, because it really is, it's like, you have to just remove it from the kids. Yeah. You cannot parent around social media. You can't. Even if it's 20 minutes a time, if they get a little 20 minute hit, that's enough information in the right way they consume content for that to shape their brain in a way that you're going like, that's not the child that I raised. Like, this is not what's going on in the household. That's because somebody else on some digital platform is raising your kids. And that makes parenting 20 times more difficult. Among the most difficult things for you had to be finding out that you were your dad had Parkinson's, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So you have this pillar of strength, the stoic, Nigerian Muslim, yeah. <laughs> you know, straight as an arrow. Yeah. And tell me about what was it like when you first found out that your dad had this disease that is debilitating, that will shorten his life? Yeah, it was tough. I mean, you know, for as, you know, 19, I think it was 1998 when he was misdiagnosed in 98, 99, and then in 2000, we found out that he had Parkinson's. And it was hard for me to believe. Like, I, I had what I call, I make this term up, I don't know, maybe it's the thing, but it was like Superman syndrome, where I thought my father was, or my dad, yeah. Superman, like, he's Superman. Like, I thought my dad worked so hard with his 24-hour beeper and his 24 hours on his truck. Uh, Express Rooter was my dad's business. Like, I think my dad is quitting. I think he doesn't want to work anymore. I think he's just burnt out. So he's saying he has Parkinson's. Like, this is what went through my mind. Oh, wow, yeah. Because I'm like... You can't accept it. Yeah, he's 6'3", he's 300 plus pounds. You know, he's not fat, he's just thick. Like, think of the most solid offensive lineman. You know, <laughs> sausage for fingers, deep voice. You know, I mean, it's like, no way. Yeah, can, these like, things don't add up. No, they don't add up. He can lift a house. You know, I think my dad could lift a car. You know what I mean? That's who my father was in my head. And so for years, I didn't believe it. And it wasn't until it progressed, I'm like, oh shoot, like this is real. Then I felt hopeless. And then I'm like, I don't know what to do. My dad can help me. Like it made me realize the fragility of life, right? And then, I, then my mom passes away. So all these things are kind of happening, you know, in my- you And your know, mom was yeah. taken too early. She was in a car accident. Yeah, in a car accident. Yeah, and so that was that was a mind blown because that that shifted everything for me. Like, oh boy, it made me cling to my relationships differently, right? Because I'm like, you know, you think if you're a kid, <laughs> this is crazy. I used to think like if I was ever in a plane accident, I would wait till the plane got really really low, open the thing out, and roll out, and I would survive. <laughs> Because when you're young, you think yeah. you're invincible. Why don't people just jump out when they get close to the ground? Close to the ground, right? Like, you, <laughs> it's, it's how you would think. Or at least as a young person, yeah. like, oh, I could survive. But when that happened to my mom, I'm going, oh, anybody can die. Because you know death is real. But until it happens in your immediate family and somebody like that, it was just like, oh, shoot. And so I try to cherish relationships and the ones that I can preserve. But when I saw that and seeing that happen to my dad, it just, it shook up everything for me. But, you know, my father has been battling still with, with us today. He's been battling um, Parkinson's and, you know, it's, it's changed his life, but it, 
it encouraged me. Well, it was actually, there was a gentleman by the name of Jimmy Choi who competes on American Ninja Warrior. Yeah. He has Parkinson's. He was competing with Parkinson's. He was doing so much to raise awareness and it made me go, because I, my father was just kind of, I thought it was just happening to me, right? And so once he used his platform, I go, man, I need to use my platform. So I then linked up with Michael J. Fox and his foundation to utilize, you know, my influence and in being able to bring awareness to being able to bring in money for research and a cure, hopefully finding a cure for Parkinson's and my father. I saw that Michael J. Fox uh, has, a, you got a quote right here on the yeah. front of the book. Yeah. So that's how you guys got yeah. connected. Yeah, yeah, this, I mean, because he's a warrior, what he's done. I remember when I met the Michael J. Fox, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, it was like, man, this is crazy. I'm sitting in the same room with Michael J. Fox and he was like, um, look, I don't even want to, I don't even want to have this foundation for a long time. I actually want to find the cure and close shop. I was like, oh, I'm in on this. I'm like, it's like, I'm not like, I'm not yeah. trying to do this for a long, you think I want to do this for a long time? And I'm like, what a mission, what a mission to be able to find a cure and, and to be able to close down shop. I'm like, all right, let's close down shop. You know, let's close down shop. Let's find a cure and let's, you know, let's do good work. So, you know, my father having Parkinson's is like, I feel it's the way that I can honor my father for all that he's done. It's like, you know, what a blessing that would be to be able to be, you know, a small part of bringing awareness and fundraising for Parkinson's and in his lifetime being able to find, like, man, it would be cool. Like, I still think in my head, if my, they found a cure today, my father would get back to work and he'd be at Express Rooters. Like, I could see it in my head. Like, that would be, and even if he's, oh, I'm too old for that. I would like, I would buy a truck. I would put all the tools back in. I would paint it the same exact color. Would you color. give him a little bit of his, old, his own medicine? Uh, <laughs> yeah. You start something, you finish it. You got to work at least one day and you got to go run the route. I, I mean, I have, you know, fond memories of him bringing out the Thomas guide and mapping out where he needed to go to the next. You know, I have those, you know, those really good memories of him doing that, you know? I know you've talked about your football career elsewhere and I, you don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but I, I think one of the things that's interesting is, you know, you didn't have an easy go of it with football, right? I mean, you, you encountered yeah. a lot of challenges. Yeah. Well, let's just talk about that for a little bit. You know, for me, football was something I grew to love. I didn't love it at first. Um, and it wasn't until my brother had massive success in college and that he was being considered for the NFL that I go, wait, maybe I could do this. But it was hard because in college I was constantly being compared to him and I hadn't even found my way as a football player. Well, you only started to play in 11th grade. So really my senior year was the first yeah. year I actually played. Um, I understand that you didn't necessarily, like, that you had coaches that were like, I'm gonna have to physically show you your yes. positions. Yes. So tell me about that. Yeah, so Coach Del Delgado, who I give a lot of credit to, Coach Delgado, I remember- Is this freshman year of college? Freshman year in college. Um, because in, in high school, I would just had Timothy Moore, my linebacker, he had to put me in position. It was A gap, B gap, C gap. That's all I knew. Because I didn't want to really know anything about anything else. A gap, B gap, and get the guy with the ball. Yeah, your head's filled with basketball. Yeah, right, you're, right. Hey, I'm here, I'm gonna do it, fine. Right, right, right. A gap, B gap, C gap, go. Cool. Then I get here, my, my coach Delgado tells me, line up on the tackle. I was like, oh shoot. Mm -hmm. Coach, which one's the tackle? He goes, what? <laughs> and he goes, this is the tight end. This is the tackle. This is the guard. And this is the mother center. <laughs> and I was so embarrassed, but he was so mad. Like, how dare you? Like, how are you here? And yeah, not how know are you this? here? I'm like, I don't know what these people are. You desecrate the field <laughs> right. and the game by coming on and my I field. Never, I not never forgot these it. Things. He was so mad and it was so startling that that's how I remembered. Like, and before, like, that's how I would go. And I go, and this is the month. <laughs> so, I would do that until it became natural where I could, you know, learn the different techniques and stuff like that. But yeah, so football, my journey really was, I was starting to appreciate. And once I knew basketball was out, it was finalized when I went to my head coach uh, at San Diego State, Coach Ted Toner, who I absolutely love. And he said one of his recruiting techniques was, you know, yeah, you, you know, learn football your first year and we'll give you an opportunity your sophomore year. I didn't forget that because basketball is my life. I'm like, Oh, I'm going to play at San Diego State. Oh, I'm going to play. Basketball? Hey, basketball. Oh, yeah. And I remember going up to the coach's locker room, and it's my sophomore year, the beginning of my sophomore year. I put in, you know, red-shirted. I'd like, hey, coach, I want to talk to you about what you said when you recruited me that I could play basketball. And he looked at me up and down and goes, 
I'm still waiting for you to become a football player. Yeah. And slammed the door right in front of my face. And this is in front of all my teammates. And they all look like. <laughs> and that was the last time I ever had a basketball conversation. So that idea of playing basketball was over. And then I just fully dedicated because he had to close the chapter for me because I wasn't going to let it go. I wasn't right. going to let it go. You know, there's something about those moments where th these harsh choice feeling choices, mm. it's like they're the they're the right choice. They're the courageous choice. Yeah. But it's like <laughs> he wasn't he wasn't giving you any room. No, he wasn't. But, you know, it's like being a parent because, you know, sometimes you see things like in and, and this is hard to convey to your your own kids. Like you see them going down a certain path. And you're like, I'm telling you, you got to trust me. You need to be on this path, right? And they're fighting that, whether they trust you or they think you're outdated or you, they think you've, you know, you, you just started life. So you, what do you know about anything? You know what I mean? What's that old <laughs> thing? Like, you know, when I was, when I was, uh, when I was 15, I thought my dad was an idiot when I, and when I was, uh, by the time I got to be 30 or 40, he learned a lot. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I call my dad now, even though he's slowed by Parkinson's and sometimes he mumbles and I try to pick up what he's saying. And, but I go like, dad, how did you do this? Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. Or, you know, like sometimes I'm stuck in traffic. I'm going, wait a second. My dad had to drive through this crap and had multiple, I, I started doing the calculation. Yeah. Like, if he was doing ninety nine dollars for LA a, a all over LA, I'm like, how many how many actual like clients did you get to? Like, hell, if I run three appointments, that's all day. I mean, if I'd run three errands in LA, that's gonna take me all day. And he was as far as Calabasas to. I mean, he was all over LA. You know, like I'm like, but there's no way you could actually be productive. So you have this draft experience. You get you're in. You, oh. you commit to football. You play through college. Tell me tell me about the how do you end up in the NFL? That was the worst day ever, man. I go to watch the draft with my my best friend, J.R. Tolver. I'm at his house, his parents' house, watching it. He gets drafted in the fifth round. I thought I was going to go maybe in the third round, maybe as late as the fifth. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, surely I'm going to get drafted. My brother got drafted, you know, two or three years prior in the uh, in the fifth round. Fifth round goes, sixth round goes, seventh round goes. And I'm going, oh. <gasps> And it's like, you'd work for something for so long. This was an accumulation of my entire athletic career. And it's like, oh my gosh, it's going to end. That's it. I walked to the nearby golf course and I'm crying and it felt like my life was over. And then my coach's son, um, Coach Toner, his son was my agent, uh, mentor and friend now. And he calls and says, how does the silver and black sound? I'm just like, that sounds fine. Like I went in as a free agent. You have some co any colors. Any, any color. Pick any two colors. Yeah, actually, it could have been any color, and I would have been. Uh, I would have been like, yes. How does white and white? I don't even know who that is, but uh, if it's an NFL team, I'm going there. But that's how it started. That was my journey. It came in as a free agent, but it put a chip on my shoulder. I'm going in, and it it humbled me. You know, it humbled me, but it also again. It was, that was my, that was my whole life. That's what my book is about. It was the underdog path to success. It was talking about all the different obstacles. My life actually runs like a, like an American Ninja Warrior course. It's just one obstacle after another obstacle after another obstacle. And yeah. they seem to be increasingly more difficult and trying to problem solve. But in between each obstacle in American Ninja Warrior, there is a little platform where you get a little breather before you go on to the next thing. And so... For me, there was a little bit of a breather before then I had to then make the team. And I remember making the team and hiding from the Grim Reaper. Uh, the Grim Reaper is the guy who comes in and tells you, hey, coach wants you and your playbook. Uh, he wants you to meet him upstairs so they can cut you. And I remember the last day, 4 p.m., if I'm not mistaken, Pacific Standard, uh, t no, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 4 p.m. Eastern was the last time for, the, uh, for them to finalize the roster on the last day. And at the old Raider facility, the Oakland Raiders, there was an auxiliary locker room for the guys who were kind of like, oh, we don't know what's gonna happen. And so I remember hiding behind the door and I knew practice and I had my little <laughs> Nike watch on and I'm like, oh man, okay, I can't be late cause that's bad. So I'm gonna wait until like three minutes 
to go and then I'm gonna sprint outside and I'm hiding. I'm like, they're not gonna find me. Like, we go, oh, where's they Aquaman? May, even if they've decided to cut me, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna hack the system. I'm gonna hack the system and play. I just remember to sit in there. I should have this reenacted one day, but I'm gonna sit there and I'm like this and I'm running out and I'm the last one out, or at least I thought, and I get a slap on my butt. And I'm like, congratulations, it's Bill Romanowski telling me you made the team. I was like, no, I didn't make the team until the horn for practice. The horn for practice goes off and I'm just crying underneath my helmet like, oh my gosh, I remember going back to the hotel and I'm like, oh my gosh, I made the team. Oh my gosh, I made the team. And I must've been in that room for three hours. And then it hit me like, oh shoot, I don't have a place to live. <laughs> I had never even thought that far right. out. I'm like, the next day I gotta be at the hotel. I'm like. Um, I don't have a place to live. So I called one of my teammates, good friend, Namdi Asimov. I was like, yo, can I live with you? And he was like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, man, yeah, yeah. So I ended up rooming with him, but I had no plans because all I was focused on was making the team. And I remember calling my dad and telling my dad I, I made the team. And it was like one of the first time, because my dad saved the I'm proud of you. That was probably one of two times my dad told me, you know, he was proud of me. And it was just like, <gasps> I was like, and it meant a lot. Now I feel like as a father, I say it all the time and I think it might lose its value. You know, oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. You're proud of everything. You're, of course you're my man. But when my dad said it, it meant something. It was not, it was not said lightly. You know what I mean? Because when I graduated from elementary, well, you still have middle school. When I graduated from middle school, well, you still have high school. <sighs> okay, dad, I graduated from high school. Well, you still have college. I graduated from college. Well, you still have the real world. Like, damn, man, like, you, you gonna say congratulations or what? You know, like, he would never say it. I'm like, damn. And then to finally say it after, you know, I made the team was like, oh, man, I, I, was, a, I was an emotional mess afterwards. This is one of these things that I think is so hard because there is like a power yeah. in that, a, a little bit of that scarcity of, of yes. praise, right? Yep. You know, the everybody gets a trophy thing. I think most reasonable people think everybody gets a trophy is pretty, pretty bad. Yeah. But then, you know, almost never getting a trophy or only saying, I, you know, I'm proud of you once or twice. That's maybe not enough. How have you sort of attenuated that with your, as a dad yourself with, you have four kids. Yeah. I'm probably somewhere in the middle. I probably lean towards the heavier side of saying it. Um, a, because I didn't have it. B, because there is pressure. I like my father's model, actually, because I know how much value I put into that. When you hear it, you go, I made it. But if you say- Blackbar, Why I'm, don't you walk in the walk? If you say you like it. I, I Because it's, you know, I am, I'm sensitive. I'm not, again, this is part of my, my flaw. Like I recognize that me being a people pleaser, you know, when you're raising kids and you know, me and my wife, and we have different ways of how we, you know, say and do things. And yeah, it's just, so it's difficult because you're, you're walking yeah. like, oh, I'm so proud of all this. I'm like, I'm like, you know what? Like, like, for example, my son, my, my youngest son will say, you know, I'm good at this. I'm good at this. And I'm going, I need to burst this bubble because my dad, well, you haven't done anything yet. What do you, like, it would just call out. I'm like, okay, I don't want to tear down his confidence. And I was like, well, son, <laughs> you know, so I'm trying to over explain it. Like, well, you got to put in 10,000 hours. You got to really, you can't just say you're great at everything or I'm an expert is what he says. I'm an expert. I'm an expert. Like, oh. They all think they're experts. Yeah, right. Like, you actually have to work to be an yeah. expert. I'm like, I'm trying to manage his expectations. So I find myself explaining more. You know, but you're gonna be there, you're gonna get there, you're gonna get there, but there's something about, yeah. for me, that what gave me a chip as an athlete was I was never a starter in basketball. I didn't become a starter in sports until I played football. Like, that was the first time I'd ever become a starter. And so the sting of not being a starter, especially on the basketball team where all these guys were so good and I wanna, it just kept me hungry. So I never felt this sense of I made it. It's like, I gotta keep going, I gotta keep going, I gotta keep going. Whereas I think when you overpraise and you're saying good, like, I think you can lose that appetite to want to do better and greater and push yourself. The transition out of, of football. We've had uh, Nate Boyer on the show who yeah. works with um, Jay Glazer and mm -hmm. MVP. And so, and we had Jay on, you know, just, just yesterday. Love Jay, yep. And that transition out of professional sports is is a really interesting challenge for a, a lot of guys. Yeah. And for 
but men and women. Yeah, you know, you coming out of football, you got all this structure. You said, like, look, I'm stru- I have this structured path. School is super structured. Mm-hmm. And then you get into you get into the NFL, structure, there's one guy that's the boss, your coach, like like your yeah. teacher. Um, what was it like when you put that behind you? It was depressing. It was probably one of the lowest points in my life because everyone that you know you were cool with that were your brothers you, i would die for you all this stuff all this just love and just solidarity and solidarity goes away all of a sudden your phone calls aren't being returned oh i'm busy i'm like hey, fool you ain't busy man i had the same schedule with you two weeks ago <laughs> like i know your schedule <laughs> you, <laughs> you at the house playing you know yeah at the time nintendo or super nintendo like you're not that busy, but it was just like, there was this, this, uh, you used to play. And so there was a separation, like you're on the out, like your code to get into the facility doesn't work. Uh, you know, you have to go check in and it's just, it's like, I, I would imagine. You're just a quasi- fan now. Yeah, you're just a fan. You're just a fan. And then with my size, it was, I couldn't escape it no matter where I went. Like, oh, how come I'm not playing? You should be playing. Are you an athlete? You should be playing. It was like. So then you go through the identity crisis. So first you're shunned, then you go through an identity crisis. Wait, who am I? People see me and only see athlete written all over me. And I'm going, "Uh, I used to play, but I don't want to tell people I used to play. Then it's like, well, oh, how come you're not playing anymore? I'm like, "Uh, it's just weird. So then you go into hiding. And then I was like, I just want to go in, go out later at night so I can go in and out so nobody would talk to me and see me. You're sitting in your place. And then you're going, okay, I, I need to do something, right? I can't just sit like this. And that was, that was when I had to redirect, like being in the house for so long, I had to think, what is it that you want to do? And so I had to create my own path. It's like, I didn't have a big enough name to where I thought I could just walk up to ESPN. Although I do have a funny ESPN story, Al Jaffe, Fred Brown, never forget. They invite me up to Bristol, Connecticut. I remember it was a small little city in Connecticut and I go over in there and um, I said, yo, you know, I want to do broadcasting. And they go, what makes you any different from any of the other big name guys who've won Super Bowl? And, the, and they didn't say it in a mean way. They were just giving me a reality check. Yeah. Like, and I'm thinking I'm going to interview there. And I'm thinking, oh, here you I'm go. I'm a good looking guy. I'm yeah, big. I've been cut three times, but you know, I played in the <laughs> NFL. I was like, <laughs> like, no, dude, like you need to go and go get some reps. If you want to survive in this business, you got to go get some reps. I'm like, but you give me the reps. So they gave me a tour of ESPN. I remember seeing all these satellites. Peace. And again, they were super cool. They didn't, it wasn't in a disrespectful way, but it was a reality check. Like, dang, like, how am I going to create something for myself? And I go, aha, I got about $300,000 left over from the NFL. I know what I'll do. I'll bet on myself. I went to go knock at the local San Diego NBC 739. And I went, knocked on doors, said, hey, my name is Akbar Bajapia Miller. I played a little bit for the Chargers, for the Aztecs. I go, we know who you are. I was like, hey, I would love to do the sports update, you know, for the Chargers and for the Aztecs, and I'll do it for free. For free? Yeah, I'll do it for free. <laughs> Sold. <laughs> like, it was like... I like that price. Yeah, 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 right. Oh, like for free. And I would just show up. And I'm like, in my mind, I was just going to pay myself to survive however I was going to survive. And I did that for a couple of years until I started to build my reps. Because the biggest thing I got from ESPN was that you need to go get reps. And this is before, you know, you could do YouTube and whatever. Yeah. So I had to create my own. So I call it the backdoor approach because I knew all the former guys who played in the NFL and lived in San Diego, they would want to get paid for it. Like, I ain't going to, like, you go from making big checks to zero, you know, or making, you know, a, a small amount. So they were like, I'm not doing that. I'm like, I'll do it. I'll do it for free and I'll do it. I'll show up whenever you want me to show up. And I did. So you put reps in, you invest in yourself. Yeah. You're working for free. I think this is one of these things that's so powerful because our kids come out of school and I think too many think that now it's time to find out. Now it's time to, to, to get the thing that I'm owed or now I'm a thing. Yeah. Now I'm something. Now I'm, I'm a, if you go to film school, now I'm a director. It's like, no, you're not. You're a production assistant. Go get me coffee. (laughs) You, you, this idea that, uh, work is an investment in your own future. Yeah. 
How are you instilling that in your kids? Well, I've got one getting ready to graduate next month um, from, you know, the University of Oregon. And he's about to have that reality for himself. Um, but, you know, it's something that has been a process of teaching him, like, no, you're not owed anything. Because you have your college degree, no one's just going to be like, hey, here you go. You have to be very intentional as far as what you want. So the thing I learned the most was, and people asked me like, oh, it must've been easy for, I was like, I wasn't a big name football player. People weren't knocking at my door. Like we want you on TV. Like I had to be very clear and focused on what I wanted to do. And so I targeted it and I just moved towards it rather than going, it should just happen and fall in my lap. And somehow it's a miracle in some, and I was willing to do anything. And that's when you know you're moving in the right direction, when you're willing to do anything to stay on that path. And so that's where I'm challenging him. Like, hey, I'm, I'm helping. I'm probably not as, you know, as raw as my life's out, but I'm like, hey, I'm gonna give you a year to figure this out, but you gotta figure it out in a year's time. And I'm dead serious. Like, you're, you're, you're cut off. Like, not cut off, like, you know, but financially, you need to make it happen. Because if you don't feel the burn, you're gonna yeah. go through life thinking, you know, oh, I'll just, like, you gotta, you gotta make a way for yourself. You had a similar thing when you joined um, American Ninja Warrior, right? You yeah. have sort of a, you've talked about this, this, yeah. a difficult first year. That year, first year was horrible. I tell people, don't watch that first season, my first season in 2013, but I had to learn on the go, but I was given so much grace by Kent Weed, Arthur Smith, Brandon, um, all the people there, my, my co-host, uh, Matt Eisman, because it was so rough. It was literally being thrown into the fire and say, go, because it was sports entertainment, or excuse me, sports broadcasting is a lot different than, you know, the sports entertainment. Ninja Warrior is an entertainment show, right? And so but there's an, obviously the athletic version of it, but there were so many of these functions that I wasn't host read and reading from a prompter and I couldn't read and I couldn't memorize the script and it was just, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna get fired. There's no way they're ever going to, to bring me back. Fast forward 11 years later, I'm you know still hosting American Ninja Warrior and it's been one of the greatest gifts ever. It, to me, you know, in my eyes will go down as probably one of the, you know, you talk about focusing and, you know, going through obstacles and going through hurdles, like to me, this is everything wrapped into that story. It's why I wrote the book, Everyone Can Be a Ninja, because even when it seems impossible, if you just get on the obstacle, get on the course and run it and stay focused on hitting that buzzer, you'll get to it. And I make it sound easy, but it wasn't easy. It was one of the hardest challenges in my life was to make that transition from one thing into something totally different. Remember, I played sports my whole life, so I had no real work experience outside of playing football. Like right. there was no real work experience. So I had to take everything I learned and then that turned into, you know, going on the talk and being able to continue to grow my career in that in that way. What's the new thing you've got coming up? There's a new show on uh, Roku called Fight to Survive. And this is the first time that I've hosted a show by myself. And so there was a lot to learn in that area, but you know, it's one of my, you know, prouder projects that I've been a part of a great team that I worked with, and it's a, a new survival show. I can't wait for everyone to watch it this summer. It, it shows you the primitive side of humanity and what you'll do when your back is against the wall. One of the things I love about the kind of TV you've been a part of since since you left, you know, sports behind is, it's a fundamentally, like, it's like the best of the American sort of mindset, yeah. I feel like. You know, American Ninja Warrior, you know, first of all, Americans in the title, but I yeah. think it belongs there because it's it's positive. It's about being excited for that victory. Yeah. It's, it's not about celebrating when people fall. Right. Uh, I'm a natural cheerleader. I wanted, I wanted people to cheerlead for me. People ask me, where does that energy come from? I was like, well, shoot, <laughs> when you're, you know, the 54th guy or the 53rd guy on the roster, right? You know, if you make a play, I wanted John Madden to say my name. But John Madden, <laughs> if I made a tackle, he was going to talk about the biggest guy, the linebacker, or Charles Woodson, or Rod Woodson. He wasn't going to talk about me. But I was just, I, like, I made a tackle, man. Like, say my name at least. You know, I want John Madden to say my name. And but you can just have the AI Madden say it now. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and so um, I said, if I ever had that opportunity, I would praise and give people. So from our biggest ninjas 
to our less known ninjas, I make sure I give them all the same type of love. The preparation I put into really understanding and knowing their story um, is, is major. So that shifted the way I relate to the athletes. And even when I'm doing, whether it's the fight to survive or the talk, like I wanna make sure whoever we're interviewing, I wanna make sure that I understand who they are and give them their love and appreciate them. So I just wanna appreciate. So. I'm really, if you really think about it, I'm not really a TV host. I'm actually just a cheerleader. Like, you know what I mean? Speaking of difficult cheerleading jobs, yeah. how do you get your kids to participate in these TikToks? Because anything I do with my son, he's like, pop, you cringe. Yeah, 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 cringe. Yeah, yeah. Dad's your cringe. Or, and we have a great relationship and yeah. we go bowling every Sunday. And there's, but it's like, how do you manage to overcome cringe pop? Well, you, you know, they still say I'm cringe no matter what, and they think that they can have a say on my, you know, but it's blown up. My TikTok is over a million followers. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, and I try to tell the kids, it's like, you guys might need, but there's a dynamic there. And it all started during the pandemic. And it started like with the same mission that you have. Like I wanted to show fathers, specifically black fathers in the relationship that I have with my kids. And it was, I've never blatantly said it, but the undertone is there because there's not representation of fathers in general, let alone black fathers, you know, being present and available with their kids. So it's just really just having fun and doing stuff. And, you know, look, I'm not gonna lie. I got a team that helps me put together, you know, hey, we're gonna do this and so on and so forth. But it started off as something genuine that kind of grew into something bigger. And so we've, we turned it into a little business too, you know? And so the kids get it. I'm teaching them economics behind it, the economics behind it, because they still don't have oh, that's social awesome. media. And so we've, my account has turned into a family account that they don't have any part in. When it does well, I show it to them. Hey, guys, see, like, ah, people love it, man, it's funny. And then that's it. So they get their little hit, but then that way it's not like they have to have their own social media and the pressure that comes with. You know, we're called Dad Saves America. And, you know, you're telling stories on the air. Um, what do you see as your role in the American story? You know what? I, I don't know how to answer that one, but I will say, if anything... I would want at least God to look it down and say, when my time is up on this earth, you good and faithful servant, you did exactly what I asked you to do. You raised your kids the way you were supposed to raise. You and your wife raised your kids the way you're supposed to do. And you made better people and those people made a better world. I know I'm gonna have my flaws, my kids are gonna have their flaws, but if I can just give to them all the, all the things that I've learned and pass it down to them, and they can take that and make their own recipe to make the world better. And not just in a generic making the world better. Like we do have some serious issues that needs to be addressed that continues to get swept under. That's my hope because look, I try to be positive, but the older I get, I feel like I'm becoming a little bit more cynical. And because you see the world rapidly changing and the rap the world getting rapidly more aggressive and yeah. less you know, uh, there's this less cohesion and cohesiveness. Boy, man, I just, we need somebody. Maybe one of my kids will be one of the little pop off that just go off and boom. And before you know it, like they're bringing everybody together. It takes one, Martin Luther King did it. Barack Obama had the op opportunity to do it. Um, there've been so many people, you know, that have the ability and the strength to bring people together. So I guess fulfill the last name, big man, come save me. Akbar, thanks for being on Dad Saves America. Hey, thank you so much. Appreciate it's been it. great. Yeah, this is a great podcast. It really is. Thank Appreciate you. it. Absolutely. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Akbar Baja Biamila. My main takeaway from this conversation was that regardless of the challenges our nation may face, America remains a shining beacon of hope for those seeking a better life from all around the world. It serves as a testament to the limitless possibilities that can be achieved through perseverance, faith, and the pursuit of the American dream. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with your friends and family. And be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. At Dad Saves America, we believe that dads are heroes that play an essential role in overcoming the challenges we all face together. And now, I leave you with a real awesome dad moment. Come on, no, 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 I ain't helping. Let's go. Come on, get that thing over here. Come on, get that thing over here. Come on, back. Pull him back this way. Pull him back! Pull him back! You got a good? Where are you going? Reel it! Okay. Help! Come on, Bobby! 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 Come
I'm not helping. Get the back. I'm not helping. Get the back. Oh, man. Don't let him whoop you. Don't let him whoop you. Come on. Really? Really? He's up there now. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Oh, my God. Woo! Woo! Oh, I'm excited! Oh I feel so 